Elsa Reads A Game of Thrones by George Martin Chapter 19 John The courtyard rang to the Song of Swords. Under black wool, boiled leather and mail, sweat trickled icily down John's chest as he pressed the attack. Grant stumbled backward, defending himself clumsily. When he raised his sword, John went underneath it with a sweeping blow that crunched against the back of the other boy's leg and sent him staggering. Grant's stone cut was answered by an overhand that dented his helm. When he tried a side swing, John swept aside his blade and slammed the mad forearm into his chest. Grant lost his footing and sat down hard in the snow. John knocked his sword from his fingers with a slash to his wrist that brought a cry of pain. Enough! Sir Alistair Thorne had a voice with an edge like very leering steel. Grant cradled his hand. That bastard broke my wrist! The bastard hamstrung you, opened your empty skull and cut off your hand, or would have if these blades had an edge. It's fortunate for you that the watch needs stable boys as well as rangers, so Alice suggested a jar and toad. Get the arrows on his feet, he has funeral arrangements to make. John took off his helm as the other boys were pulling Grant to his feet. The frosty morning air felt good on his face. He leaned on his sword, drew a deep breath, and allowed himself a moment to savor the victory. That is a long sword, not an old man's cane, said Alistair said sharply. Are your legs hurting, Lord Snow? John hated that name, a mockery that Sir Alistair had hung on him the first day he came to practice. The boys had picked it up, and now he heard it everywhere. He slid the long sword back into its scabbard. No, he replied. Thorn strode toward him, his crisp black leathers whispering faintly as he moved. He was a compact man of fifty years, spare and hard, with grey in his black hair and eyes like chips of onyx. The truth now, he commanded. I'm tired, John admitted. His arm burned from the weight of the longsword and he was starting to feel his bruises now that the fight was done. What you are is weak. I won. No, the arrows lost. One of the other boys sniggered. John knew better than to reply. He had beaten every one that Sir Alistair had sent against him, yet it gained him nothing. The mastered arm served up only derision. Thorn hated him. John had decided, of course, he hated the other boys even worse. That will be all, Thorn told them. I can only stomach so much ineptitude in any one day. If the others ever come for us, I pray they have archers, because you lot are fit for nothing more than arrow fodder. John allowed the rest back to the armory, walking alone. He often walked alone here. There were almost twenty in the group he trained with, yet not one he could call a friend. Most were two or three years his senior, yet not one was half the fighter Rob had been at fourteen. Darian was quick but afraid of being hit. Pip used his sword like a dagger. Jaren was weak as a girl, grown slum and clumsy. Holder's blows were brutally hard but he ran right into her attacks. The more time he spent with them, the more John despised them. Inside, John hung sword and scabbard from a hook in the stone wall, ignoring the others around him. Methodically, he began to strip up his mail, leather and sweat-soaked woolens. Chunks of cold bird and iron braziers at either end of the long room, but John found himself shivering. The chill was always with him here. In a few years, he would forget what it felt like to be warm. The weariness came on him suddenly as he donned the rough spun blacks that were their everyday wear. He sat on a bench, his fingers fumbling with the fastenings on his cloak. So cold, he thought, remembering the warm halls of Winterfell where the hot waters ran through the walls like blood through a man's body. There was scant warmth to be found in Castle Black. The walls were cold here and the people colder. No one had told him the night's watch would be like this, no one except Tyrion Lannister. The dwarf had given him the truth on the road north, but by then it had been too late. John wondered if his father had known what the war would be like. He must have, he thought. That only made it hurt the worse. Even his uncle had abandoned him in this cold place at the end of the world. Up here, the genial Benjamin Stark he had known before became a different person. He was first ranger, and he spent his days and nights with Lord Commander Mormont and Maester Eamon and the other high officers, while John was given over to the less than tender charge of Sir Alistair Thorne. Three days after their arrival, John had heard that Benjamin Stark was to lead a half-dozen men on the ranging into the haunted forest. 
That night he sought out his uncle in the great timber common hall and pleaded to go with him. Benji refused him curtly. This is not Winterfell, he told him as he cut his meat with fork and dagger. On the wall a man gets only what he earns. You are no ranger, John, only a green boy with the smell of summer still on you. Stupidly, John argued. I'll be fifteen on my name bit, eh, he said. Almost a man grown. Benjamin Stark frowned. A boy you are, and a boy you'll remain until Sir Alistair says you're fit to be a man of the Night's Watch. If you thought your Stark blood would win you easy favours, you were wrong. We put aside our old families when we swear our woes. Your father will always have a place in my heart, but these are my brothers now. He gestured with his dagger at the man around them, all the hard, cold man in black. John rose at dawn the next day to watch his uncle leave. One of his rangers, the big, ugly man, sang a body song as he settled his garron, his breath steaming in the cold morning air. Ben Stark smiled at that, but he had no smile for his nephew. How often must I tell you no, John? We'll speak when I return. As he watched his uncle lead his horse into the tunnel, John had remembered the things that Tyrion Lannister told him on the King's Road, and in his mind he saw Ben Stark lying dead, his blood red on the snow. The thought made him sick. What was he becoming? After what he saw that ghost in the loneliness of his cell and buried his face in a thick white fur. If he must be alone, he would make solitude his armor. Castle Black had no godswood, only a small sept and a drunken septum, but John could not find it in him to pray to any gods, old or new. If they were real, he thought, they were as cruel and implacable as winter. He missed his true brothers. Little Rick and bright eyes shining as he begged for a sweet, Rob his rival and best friend and constant companion, Bran, stubborn and curious, always wanted to follow and join in whatever John and Rob were doing. He missed the girls too, even Sansa, who never called him anything but my half-brother, since she was old enough to understand what bastard me meant. And Ira. He missed her even more than Rob, skinny little thing that she was, all scrapped knees and tangled hair and torn clothes, so fierce and willful. Ira never seemed to fit, no more than he had, yet she could always make John smile. He would give anything to be with her now, to muster up her hair once more and watch her make a face to hear her finish a sentence with him. You broke my wrist, bastard boy. John lifted his eyes at the sullen voice. Gren loomed over him, thick of neck and red of face, with three of his friends behind him. He knew Todder, a short, ugly boy with an unpleasant voice. The recruits all called him Toad. The other two were the ones Jorin had brought north of them, John remembered, rapers taken down in the fingers. He'd forgotten their names. He hardly ever spoke to them if he could help it. They were brutes and bullies, with other thimble of honor between them. John stood up. I'll break the other one for ye if you ask nicely. Graham was sixteen and a head taller than John. All four of them were bigger than he was, but he did not scare them. He'd beaten every one of them in the yard. Maybe we'll break you, one of the rapers said. Try. John reached back for a sword, but one of them grabbed his arm and twisted it behind his back. You make us look bad, complained Toad. You looked bad before I ever met you, John told him. The boy who had his arm janked up upward on him hard. Pain lanced through him, but John would not cry out. Toad said close. The little lordling has a mouth on him, he said. He had pig eyes, small and shiny. Is that your mummy's mouth, bastard? What was she, some whore? Tell us her name. Maybe I had her a time or two. He laughed. John twisted like an eel and slammed a heel down across the instep of the boy holding him. There was a sudden cry of pain and he was free. He flew a toad, knocked him backward over a bench and landed on his chest with both hands on his throat, slamming his head against the packed earth. The tooth from the fingers pulled him off, throwing him roughly to the ground. Gren began to kick at him. John was rolling away from the blows when a booming voice cut through the gloom of the armory. Stop this now! John pulled himself at his feet. Donald Noy stood glowering at them. The yard is for fighting, the armorer said. Keep your quarrels out of my armory or I make them my quarrels. You won't like that. Toad sat on the floor, gingerly feeling the back of his head. His fingers came away bloody. He tried to kill me. It's true, I saw it, one of the rapers put in. He broke my wrist, Gren said again, holding out to Noy for inspection. The armorer gave the offered wrist the previous of glances. A bruise, perhaps a sprain. Mr. Eamon will give you a solve. Go with them, Todder. 
that had once looking after. The rest of you return to your cells. Not you, Snow, you stay. John sat heavily on the long wooden bench as the others left, oblivious to the looks they gave him. The silent promise is a future retribution. His arm was throbbing. The watch has need of every man it can get, Donald Noy said when they were alone. Even men like Toad. You won't win any honors killing him. John's anger flared. He said my mother was a whore. I heard it. What of it? Lord Eddard Stark was not a man to sleep with hordes, John said icily. His honor did not prevent him from fathering a bastard. Did it? John was cold with rage. Can I go? You go when I tell you to go. John stared sullenly at the smoke rising from the braziers until Noy took him under the chin, thick fingers twisting his head around. Look at me when I'm talking to you, boy. John looked. The armorer had a chest like a keg of ale and a gut to match. His nose was flat and broad, and he almost seemed in need of a shave. The left sleeve of his black wool tunic was fastened at the shoulder with a silver pin in the shape of a longsword. Words won't make your mother a whore. She was what she was, and nothing Toad says can change that. You know we have men on the wall whose mothers were whores. Not my mother, John thought stubbornly. He knew nothing of his mother. Edda Stark would not talk of her. Yet he dreamt of her at times, so often that he could almost see her face. In his dreams, she was beautiful and high-born, and her eyes were kind. You think you had her heart being a high lord's bastard? The armorer went on. That boy Jaron is a septon's get, and Cotter Pike is the base born son of a tavern wench. Now he commands Eastwich by the sea. I don't care, John said. I don't care about them, and I don't care about you or Thorne or Benjamin Stark or any of it. I hate it here. It's too... It's cold. Yes, cold and hard and mean. That's the wall, and the man who walk it. Not like the stories your wet nurse told you. Well, piss on the stories and piss on your wet nurse. This is the way it is, and you're here for life. Same as the rest of us. Life, John repeated bitterly. The armorer could talk about life. He'd had one. He'd only taken the black after he'd lost an arm at the siege of Storm's End. Before that, he'd smithed for Sanus Baratheon, the king's brother. He'd seen the seven kingdoms from one end to the other. He'd feasted in Wench and fought in hundreds of battles. They said it was Donald Noy who'd forged King Robert's Warhammer, the one that crushed the life from Rhaegar Targaryen and the Trident. He'd done all the things that John would never do, and then when he was old, well past thirty, He'd taken a glancing blow from an axe, and the wound had festered until the whole arm had to come off. Only then, crippled, had Donald Noy come to the wall when his life was all but over. Yes, life, Noy said. A long life or a short one, it's up to you, Snow. The road you're walking, one of your brothers will slit your throat for one night. They're not my brothers, John snapped. They hate me because I'm better than they are. No. They hate you because you act like you're better than they are. They look at you and see a castle-bred bastard who thinks he's a lordling. The armorer leaned close. You're no lordling, remember that. You're a snow, not a stark. You're a bastard and a bully. A bully! John almost choked on the word. The accusation was so unjust it took his breath away. They were the ones who came after me, four of them. Four that you humiliated in the yard, four who are probably afraid of you. I've watched you fight. It's our training with you. Put a good edge on your sword and they'd be dead meat. You know it. I know it. They know it. You leave them nothing. You shame them. Does that make you proud? John hesitated. He did feel proud when he won. Why shouldn't he? But the armorer was taking that away too, making it sound as if he were doing something wrong. They're all older than me, he said defensively. Older and bigger and stronger, that's the truth. I'll wag your mastered arms taught you how to fight bigger men at Winterfell, though. Who was he, some old knight? Sir Roderick Castle, John said wearily. There was a trap here. He felt it closing around him. Donald Noy leaned forward into John's face. Now think on this boy. None of these others have ever had a mastered arms until Sir Alistair. Their fathers were farmers and wagon men and poachers, smiths and miners and also in a trading galley. What they know of fighting they learn between decks and the alleys of Old Town and Lannisport and waste their brothels and taverns on the King's Road. They may have clacked a few sticks before together before they came here, but I promise you, not one in twenty was ever rich enough to own a real sword. His look was grim. So how do you like the taste of your victories now, Lord Sword? 
Don't call me that, John said sharply, but the force had gone out of his anger. Suddenly he felt ashamed and guilty. I never... I didn't think. Best you start thinking, now I warned him. That or sleep with a dagger by your bed. Now go. By the time John left the armory, it was almost midday. The sun had broken through the clouds. He turned his back on it and lifted his eyes to the wall, blazing blue and crystalline in the sunlight. Even after all these weeks, the sight of it still gave him the shivers. Centuries of wind-blown dirt had pocked and scored it, covering the lack of foam, and it often seemed a pale grey, the colour of an overcast sky. But when the sun caught it fair on the bright day, it shone, alive with light, a colossal blue-white cliff that filled up half the sky. The largest structure ever built by the hands of man, Benjamin Stark had told John on the King's Road when they had first caught sight of the wall in the distance. And beyond a doubt, the most useless, Tyrion Lannister had added with a grin, but even the imp grew silent as they rode closer. You could see it from miles off, a pale blue line across the northern hor horizon, stretching away to the east and west and vanishing in the far distance, immense and unbroken. This is the end of the world, it seemed to say. When they finally spied Castle Black, its timbered keeps and stone towers looked like nothing more than a handful of toy blocks scattered on the snow beneath the vast wall of ice. The ancient stronghold of the Black Brothers was no Winterfell, no true castle at all. Lacking walls, it could not be defended, not from the south or east or west, but it was only the north that concerned the Night's Watch, and to the north loomed the wall. Almost seven hundred feet high it stood, three times the height of the tallest tower in the stronghold it sheltered. His uncle said the top was wide enough for a dozen armed knights to ride abreast. The gaunt outlines of huge catapults and monstrous wooden cranes stood sentry up there, like the skeletons of great birds, and among them walked men in black as small as ants. As he stood outside the armory looking up, John felt almost as overwhelmed as he had the day on the King's Road when he'd seen it for the first time. The wall was like that. Sometimes he could almost forget that it was there, the way he forgot about the sky or the earth underfoot, but there were other times when it seemed as if there was nothing else in the world. It was older than the Seven Kingdoms, and when he stood beneath it and looked up, it made John dizzy. He could feel the great weight of all that ice pressing down on him, as if it were about to topple, and somehow John knew that it, if it fell, the world fell with it. Makes you wonder what lies beyond, a, famili a familiar voice said. John looked around. Lannister, I didn't see. I mean, I thought I was alone. Tyrion Lannister was bundled in fur so thickly he looked like a very small bear. There's much to be said for taking people unawares. You never know what you might learn. You won't learn anything from me, John told him. He had seen little of the dwarfs since the journey ended, as the Queen's own brother, Tyrion Lannister, had been an honoured guest of the Night's Watch. The Lord Commander had given him rooms in the King's Tower, so called, though no king had visited it for a hundred years, and Lannister dined at Mormon's own table and spent his days riding the wall and his nights dicing and drinking with Sir Alistair and Beau Marsh and the other high officers. Oh, well, there are things everywhere I go, the little man gestured up at the wall with a nailed back walking stick. As I was saying, why is it that when one man builds a wall, the next man immediately needs to know what's on the other side? He cocked his head and looked at John with his curious, mismatched eyes. You do want to know what's on the other side, don't you? It's nothing special, John said. He wanted to ride with Benjamin Stark on his rangings, deep into the mysteries of the haunted forest, wanted to fight men's raiders' wildlings and avoid the realm against the others, but it was better not to speak of the things he wanted. The rangers say it's just woods and mountains and frozen lakes, with lots of snow and ice, and the grumpkins and snarks, Tyrion said. Let us not forget them, Lord Snow, or else what's the big thing for? Don't call me Lord Snow. The dwarf lifted an eyebrow. Would you rather be called the imp? Let them see that their words can cut you, and they'll never be free of the mockery. If they want to give you a name, take it, make it your own. Then they can't hurt you with it any more. He gestured with his stick. Come, walk with me. They'll be serving some vile stew in the common hall by now, and I could do with a bowl of something hot. John was hungry too, so he fell in beside Lannister and started his pace to match the doll's awkward waddling steps. 
The wind was rising and they could hear the old wooden buildings creaking around them and in the distance a heavy shutter banging, over and over forgotten. Once there was a muffled thump as a blanket of snow slid from a roof and landed near them. I don't see your wolf, Lannister said as they walked. I chained up in the old stables when we're training. They board out the horses in the east stables now, so no one bothers him. The rest of the time he stays with me, my sleeping cell is in Hardin's tower. That's the one with the broken battlement, no? Shattered stone in the yard below, and I leaned like it, our noble King Robert, after a long night's drinking. I thought all those buildings had been abandoned. John shrugged. No one cares where you sleep. Most of the old keeps are empty. You can pick any cell you want. Once Castle Black had housed five thousand fighting men with all the horses and servants and weapons. Now it was home to a tenth of number, and parts of it were falling into ruin. Tyrion Lannister laughter. Tyrion Lannister's laughter steamed in the cold air. I'll be sure to tell your father to arrest more stonemasons before your tower collapses. John could taste the mockery there, but there was no denying the truth. The watch had built nineteen great strongholds along the wall, but only three were still occupied. Eastwatch on its grey winter shore, the shadow tower harp at the mountains where the wall ended, and Castle Black between them at the end of the King's Road. The other keeps, long deserted, were lonely, haunted places, where cold winds whistled through black windows and the spirit of the dead manned the parapets. It's better that I'm by myself, John said stubbornly. The rest of them are scared of ghosts. Wise boys, Lannister said. Then he changed the subject. The talk is your uncle is too long away. John remembered the wish he'd wished in his anger, the vision of Benjamin Stark dead in the snow, and he looked away quickly. The dwarf had a way of sensing things, and John did not want him to see the guilt in his eyes. He said he'd be back by my name day, he admitted. His name did come and gone, unremarked, a fortnight passed. They were looking for Sir Waymer Royce, his father, Spenham, and to Lord Aaron. Uncle Benjamin said they might search as far as the Shadow Tower. That's all the way up in the mountains. I hear that a good many rangers have vanished of late, Lannister said as they mounted the steps of the common hall. He grinned and pulled open the door. Perhaps the Grumpkins are hungry this year. Inside the hall was immense and draughty, even with a fire roaring in its great hearth. Crows nested in the timbers of its lofty ceiling. John heard their cries overhead as he accepted a bowl of stew and a heel of black bread from the day's cooks. Gren and Toad and some of the others were seated at the bench nearest the warmth, laughing and cursing each other in rough voices. John eyed them thoughtfully for a moment. Then he chose a spot at the far end of the hall, well away from the other dinners. Timur Lannister sat across from him, sniffing at the stew suspiciously. Barely onion carrot, he muttered. Someone should tell the cooks a turnip is no meat. It's mutton stew. John pulled off his gloves and warmed his hand in the stew right into the bowl. The smell melted his mouth water. Snow! John knew Alistair Thorne's voice, but there was a curious note in it that he had not heard before he turned. The Lord Commander wants to see you, now. For a moment John was too frightened to move. Why would the Lord Commander want to see him? That had something about Benjamin, he thought wildly. He was dead, the vision had come true. Is it my uncle? he blurted. Is he returned safe? The Lord Commander is not accustomed to waiting, was Sir Alistair replies. And I'm not accustomed to having my commands questioned by bastards. Jim Lannister swung off the bench and rose. Stop it, Thorn, you're frightening the boy. Keep out of matters that I'm concerned, you Lannister. You have no place here. I have a place at court, though, the dwarf said, smiling. A word in the right ear and you'll die a sore, sore old man before you get another boy to train. Now tell Snow why the old bear needs him. Is there news of his uncle? No, Sir Alistair said. This is another matter entirely. A bird arrived this morning from Winterfell with a message as concerns his brother. He corrected himself, his half-brother. Bran! John breathed, scrambling to his feet. Something's happened to Bran. Tim and Lannister laid a hand on his arm. John, he said, I am truly sorry. John scarcely heard him. He brushed off Tyrion's hand and strode across the hall. He was running by the time he hit the doors. He raced to the commander's keep, dashing through drifts of old snow. When the guards passed him, he took the tower steps two at a time. By the time he burst into the presence of the Lord Commander, his boots were soaked and John was welled out and panting. 
Bran, he said. What does it say about Bran? John Mormont, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, was a gruff old man with an immense bald head and a shaggy grey beard. He had a raven on his arm and he was feeding his kernels of corn. I'm told you can read. He shook the raven off and it flapped its wings and flew to the window, where it sat watching as Mormont drew a roll of paper from his belt and handed it to John. Corn! It muttered in a his voice. Corn, corn! John's finger traced the outline of the diabolf and the white wax of the broken seal. He recognized Rob's hand, but the letters seemed to blur and run as he tried to read them. He realized he was crying, and then, through the tears, he found the sense in the words and raised his head. He woke up, he said. The gods gave him back. Crippled, Mom said. I'm sorry, boy. Read the rest of the letter. He looked at the words, but they didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Bram was going to live. My brother's going to live, he told Mormon. The Lord Commander shook his head, gathered up a fistful of corn and whistled. The raven flew to his shoulder, crying, Live, live. John ran down the stairs, a smile on his face, and Rob's letter in his hand. My brother's going to live, he told the guards. They exchanged a look. He ran back to the common hall, where he found Tyrion Lannis that just finishing his meal. He grabbed the little man under the arms, hoisted him up in the air, and spun him around in a circle. Bran is going to live, he whooped. Lannister looked startled. John put him down and thrust the paper into his hands. Here, read it, he said. Others were gathering around and looking at him curiously. John noticed Gwen a few feet away. A thick woolen bandage was wrapped around one hand. He looked anxious and uncomfortable, not menacing at all. John went to him. Gwen edged backward and put up his hands. Stay away from me, you bastard. John smiled at him. I'm sorry about your wrist. Rob used the same move of me once, only with a wooden blade. It hurt like seven hells, but you must be worse. Look, if you want, I can show you how to defend that. Elsa Thorne overheard him. Lord Snow wants to take my place now, he sneered. I'd have an easier time teaching a wolf to juggle than you will training this irates. I'll take that, Vagasa Elsa, John said. I'd love to see ghosts juggle. John heard Grant suck in his breath, shocked. Silence fell. Then Tyrion Lannister guffed. Three of the Black Brothers joined in from a nearby table. The laughter spread up and down the benches until even the cooks joined in. The birds steered into the rafters and finally even Graham began to chuckle. Sir Alistair never took his eyes from John. As the laughter rolled around him, his face darkened and his sword hand curled into a fist. That was a grievous error, Lord Snow, he said at last in the acid bones of an enemy.